Hello everybody and welcome. My name is Melissa Fox. I'm CEO of Health Consumers Queensland. And thank you all for joining us online for our Q&A, our live Q&A with Children's Health Queensland on the COVID-19 vaccine and children uh, 12 to 15. Uh, so um, I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are gathered and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, we pay respect to the traditional custodians of these lands on which we all work, walk, talk and live. Uh, now we have uh, about 100 people registered to take part in tonight uh, and um, we thank all of you for your interest in this topic. I'd like to start by handing over to Fiona Russo to introduce herself and kick off with tonight's first question. Fiona. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Fiona Russo. I am the co-chair of the Family Advisory Council here at Children's Health Queensland. I also have some children in the age bracket we're talking about tonight. So I have a personal interest in what we're talking about. Uh, so I have a couple of questions that I'll ask myself to kick things off if nobody minds. But before we do that, I thought I might pop up a quick poll just to get an idea of where people are joining us from. So I'm just gonna launch that right now. It should be jumping up on your screen any second. So if you wouldn't mind just telling us whereabouts in Queensland uh, you are joining us from tonight. Fantastic, I can see some answers jumping in. We'll have a look at those very shortly. Excellent, thanks Fiona. Um, so uh, we'll share the results of that poll um, after I've finished sharing a few housekeeping um, things. So quickly, before we get started, uh, this session is being recorded uh, and will be published online afterwards uh, via Children's Health Queensland social media channels. Uh, to keep the session manageable tonight, we'll be using the Q&A function to take your questions. Uh, so please, if you have questions for our panellists, pop them in the Q&A section, not the chat. Uh, and you'll find the button, the Q&A button, uh, in the menu bar uh, at the top of your window. If you're unable to use the chat function, if you uh, don't have access to a keyboard, or if you're unable to type, uh, sim simply use the raise hand button uh, in Zoom and we'll give you access to ask your question. Um, if we throw to you for a question, please keep your question brief as we're trying to get through as many as possible tonight. Uh, we will try to respond to all of them, uh, either in the Q&A window or directly. Uh, but if we can't keep up, please bear with us. Uh, if we run out of time, we'll endeavour to respond to any outstanding questions out of this session. Uh, we will also need to keep to topic. So if questions wander away from that, I'll step in to bring it back to the questions. Uh, and a reminder that our panellists tonight are clinicians. Uh, they're not politicians and nor are they making the policy decisions. Uh, finally, final housekeeping point uh, is that Children's Health Queensland and Health Consumers Queensland respect the rights of consumers, parents, carers to make informed decisions about your health care and the health care of your young loved ones. Uh, and we don't expect to hear a consensus of views uh, from consumers, carers, parents all of the time. We know that the COVID vaccine is one of these issues and tonight is all about helping you uh, and your families make an informed decision. Uh, we would like this to be a safe space, so we do ask if everybody uh, is respectful uh, to each other and to the panellists during today, tonight's session uh, and in the chat thread. Uh, we invite you to ask your questions or share your concerns, but we won't be allowing abusive language or the deliberate sharing of misinformation. So that's the housekeeping. We're really looking forward to tonight's session. Uh, let's go quickly to the results of the poll before we get started. So we can see there. Fiona, would you like to summarise the results? Sure. Uh, it looks like most of our families are joining us from the Greater Brisbane region, so the home turf of the Queensland Children's Hospital. Um, but we also have a few from the Sunshine Coast, Wide Bay and Burnett, Central Queensland, and a small number from Darling Downs in the southwest. Uh, big shout out to our far north people. So we've got a few people from up in far north Queensland. Hot and sunny up there, I imagine. <laughs> Thanks, Fiona. That's great. 
All right, so um, now we will hand over to our two panellists uh, to give us a presentation each before we kick off into the Q&A section. Uh, so uh, firstly, we have Dr. Sophie Wen. Uh, Sophie is a paediatric infection specialist at que Queensland Children's Hospital uh, and the medical lead for Queensland's specialist immunisation service. Dr. Adam Irwin uh, is conjoint Senior Lecturer in Paediatric Infectious Diseases at Queensland Children's Hospital and the University of Queensland. Uh, so we'll start tonight with Adam uh, setting the scene on uh, the facts about Delta and children. Thanks, Adam. Thanks so much, Melissa. A fantastic introduction. And um, yeah, what I suppose what what we've I, I was just checking up on the, the latest data on just the scale of this pandemic and the best data that we've got um, from the John Hopkins pandemic um, mapping website estimates that there have been 230 million cases of COVID-19 over the last 18 months or so and an estimated 4.7 million deaths. It's a it's it's been a really staggering experience for um, for us all, not simply medics, of course. Um, but what we observed quite early on in the pandemic is that somewhat unusually for respiratory infections, for chest infections, this, this infection seemed to affect children somewhat less than we ordinarily expect. Um, the proportion of children who seemed to get uh, uh, catch the infection the rates of spread of the infection in children and the rates of severe disease um, were surprisingly low. And though um, we've learned a great deal about the virus over the last 18 months, it still appears that those general principles hold broadly true. Um, we do still see um, severe disease in children only rarely. We have happily only seen uh, very few deaths in children um, worldwide. However, what we have seen um, in these recent months is uh, the emergence of uh, different uh, strains of the virus, which are now appearing to affect children differently. And the question is whether the virus itself is affecting children differently or the context is different. And what I mean by that is that, of course, over the last uh, number of months around the world, we've successfully immunized against COVID-19 with highly effective vaccines. And again, just reading through those John Hopkins data, it's estimated that 6 billion doses of vaccines have been administered worldwide, a, a really staggering achievement. And what that's meant is that the most vulnerable people have been protected against severe disease, rates of infection and death in older people um, have declined dramatically. It's been uh, really fantastic to see. Um, but the virus and the pandemic has now become really a pandemic of younger people, and that includes children. And so while the Delta variant that we all talk about, which is this virus which has mutated over, um, uh, over the months and is a highly transmissible virus, so it infects uh, more people than the original virus when it first emerged last year. Um, it's, and it's, uh, it, there's no evidence that it's a more dangerous virus. There's no evidence that it causes more severe disease. But it appears now to be transmitting in younger people because fewer younger people are vaccinated. And that means that we've seen lots of infections in schools and in places where there is still a great deal of virus transmission, like in Europe and North America, um, that's had a, a significant impact on um, the well-being of children. So, so while we're happy still to say that COVID-19 has, has caused very few severe illnesses and deaths in children, um, the virus itself has a profound impact on children. Um, Delta has, is making that all the more challenging because it's so transmissible. Um, and we're now at a stage where we need to seriously consider how we reduce the impact of, of, the, of the virus on children and young people. 
Thanks, Adam. Thank you so much for setting the scene. Um, Sophie, can we hand over to you um, uh, to talk about uh, the COVID-19 vaccination and kids? Sure. Thanks, Melissa. Um, so many of you will be well aware um, the Therapeutic Goods Administration Australia has provisionally approved both co um, two COVID-19 vaccines, so the Cominati, or otherwise known as the Pfizer vaccine, and the Spike Vax, or otherwise known as the Moderna vaccine for children aged 12 years and older. And it is given as a two-dose schedule, same as the adults. The time interval is a um, minimum of three weeks for Pfizer vaccines and four weeks for the Moderna vaccine. And as many of you will be well aware, um, ATAGI has recommended Pfizer for all children from 12 years of age on 27th of August, and that has now also been extended um, for Moderna vaccine. The benefits of offering COVID-19 vaccination to young adolescents aged 12 to 15 years have been carefully considered um, through the evidence that have been produced across the world, um, the real life data, and that's been weighed against the known and potential risks. And that's how ATAGI has come to its recommendation of offering COVID-19 vaccines to all children from 12 years of age onwards. And it is anticipated that by vaccinating our adolescents that we will contribute to a reduction in the circulation of the virus and the transmission in the broader population. Thank you so much, Sophie. Can I jump in very quickly with a, a quick poll? So we're going to do this poll twice. Um, the question at the beginning before we start myth busting and answering your questions is a quick one just to see how comfortable you feel right now with uh, vaccinating your child aged 12 to 15. So I'm launching that poll just now and if you're happy to answer we'd just love to see how that might change over the course of this hour. Thanks very much I can see people answering now and I'll hand back to you Sophie thank you. Okay. So we've got a couple of slides, I think, um, for busting very common myths um, that we have been hearing and, um, and patients also have been concerned about. Um, so the first vaccine myth um, that we would like to address today is the concerns raised um, about the development of the COVID-19 vaccine, that it was rushed and that it's still in trials, um, so that its effectiveness and safety cannot be trusted. And I want to counter that with um, that there are many scientifically reviewed studies um, that have found that Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are both about 95% effective and that we have that there's no testing phases that's been skipped. So what has actually happened is that some testing phases have been combined or run at the same time as each other to allow efficient um, progression and that these overlapping time frames have helped um, the development of COVID-19 vaccines um, to move in a faster pace and allow them to be available earlier to save lives um, in this current pandemic. And importantly, this vaccine, these many of these vaccine projects had a lot of resources invested in them, as it is a common, in, um, I guess, interest for everyone around the world to invest in this research and also um, to pay for these vaccines in advance to allow um, these vaccines to be developed. And because COVID-19 is so contagious and so widespread, it didn't take much you know, time for us to see if the vaccine had actually worked um, for those that were vaccinated. So for the second um, vaccine myth, the messenger RNA technology that's been used to make um, some of the COVID-19 vaccines is brand new. Actually, the messenger RNA technology that's been used behind um, two of the new coronavirus vaccines um, has actually been in development for almost two decades. And um, vaccine makers have created the technology um, and that has allowed them to respond very quickly to this new current pandemic, um, COVID-19. Last but not the least, the third vaccine myth, um, that COVID-19 vaccine changes your DNA. So the COVID-19 vaccines um, like the Pfizer and the Moderna are designed to help your body's immune system to fight the coronavirus. So the messenger RNA from the vaccines does, not, does enter your cells, but it doesn't enter the nucleus of the cells where your DNA resides. 
So the messenger RNA does its job to cause, um, to let the cell to make the protein to stimulate our immune system. And then it gets broken down quickly without affecting your DNA at all in this process. Thank you very much for that um, intro and a bit of quick myth busting. These are the questions that uh, we anticipated people might ask. So hopefully that's given some answers up front. But if you don't mind, I would like to start with a couple of my own questions. Um, so I have two daughters. I have one who is about to turn 12. And just wondering if you would recommend that we line her up for vaccination soon after that birthday. Yeah, I think it's important that, you know, as soon as she's eligible um, to be vaccinated, that we, you should arrange for her to get vaccinated in the sense that we don't know when we're likely to get an outbreak in our community. Um, looking at the current situation in our neighbor, neighboring states, it is only just a matter of time that we're going to see community transmission in our, in our uh, neighborhoods. Thank you. Uh, and along those same lines, then, if it is if it is likely that we'll have some outbreak in Queensland over the next few months, I also have a young daughter who is the reason that I'm part of the Family Advisory Council. She's a vulnerable child with a complex disability. She's 10 years old. Uh, is it likely that she will become el eligible for vaccine anytime soon? That's a really timely question um, in that uh, Pfizer have only just announced earlier this week that um, they have data to support the use um, the safety and I guess the, the um, efficacy of their vaccine in children down to five years of age. Um, they will be supplying this information to TGA for them to assess and then seeking approval for use down to um, five years of age. So meanwhile, that, I mean, that itself can take time. And meanwhile, I guess the best way we can protect our vulnerable children who cannot be vaccinated is to make sure that everyone else around them who is eligible and can be vaccinated Ah, Thank you very much. I'll hand over for some of the Q&A now. Thanks, Fiona. Um, and thanks, Sophie and Adam again. Um, uh, uh, Sophie, I would like to chat with you about what you shared about it only being a matter of time uh, until uh, a community outbreak uh, is here. Uh, um, that's been a challenging thing, I think, for lots of us who are supporting the pandemic response. Um, uh, to come to terms with and to realise and uh, to look at the challenges that have been interstate um, and to want to do what we can to try and support Queenslanders, parents, children, um, to be in the best possible position uh, uh, when that occurs up here. So we're so fortunate that we've got this time and we've got the generosity of the both of you um, to answer people's questions and uh, give them the time to, to make an informed decision. Uh, just going to the questions in the chat, in the context of that um, and in the context of what you've shared so far, um, Sophie, there's a question here that uh, talks, references some studies uh, that someone has seen um, which they believe suggests the benefits don't outweigh the risks and are asking how the injection can be justified. Um, could you let us know um, what you might know about such studies um, and address the concerns of, of that parent? Sure. I think, um, you know, when we look at um, the recommendations of vaccinating um, 12 to 15 year olds, we really have to look into both the direct and indirect benefits of vaccinating this cohort of, um, of children. And whilst, you know, we do know, fortunately, that children largely do well from COVID, in fact, um, from COVID, um, there is a small percentage of children who will get severe COVID. And if we have a vaccine that is, you know, shown to be safe and effective in, in this cohort of children and be able to prevent them from any child, children to develop severe COVID, um, then that's something we should be doing and actively um, seeking to protect our children from. Um, and there's also the possibility of following um, acute COVID infection in children um, is this multi-system inflammatory um, syndrome that we have seen coming out of um, area, other countries that have large numbers of COVID-19. And uh, in terms of, have, you know, if we can protect them from that entity itself, it's also a direct benefit from vaccinating them. 
And I think the other side of, um, of vaccinating is also about the indirect benefits of vaccinating children. Again, yes, children do well, largely, but they also are severely impacted by the many lockdowns that we have faced. Their education have been disrupted. Their social activities have been disrupted. And if we can help them to return to school by protecting everyone in school by vaccinating them, then that's an indirect benefit that we can offer them. In terms of safety, yes, there are obviously potential side effects from some of these vaccines, but everything that we do in this, I guess, decision-making process is thinking about, you know, does the benefit outweighs the risks? And my opinion is that the benefit of vaccination do outweigh the potential risks. Thank you. Thanks for that really clear answer, Sophie. Much appreciated. Um, so Fiona, would you like to ask the next question? Perhaps we could hand back and forth. Sorry to put you on the spot, but I thought it would be nice to share. That's <laughs> okay. Like there? No problem. Uh, there's a very specific uh, one in here. Sophie, I hope you don't mind me putting you on the spot, but someone has asked, their son's a small 12 year old at just 32 kilograms and has very much a little boy body. Uh, and the parent is concerned about dose. So will he receive the same dose as an adult? And is that safe? So yes, um, the, we don't um, base vaccine dosing by weight. Um, and so for all the vaccines that we give, they're not dosed by weight. And so if your child is smaller, um, we would still dose them based on their age group. Thanks, Sophie. Um, there is another question here um, in actually um, the chat. So I would just remind everyone if you could pop it over in the Q&A, um, that would be great. Um, but it's a good question, so I'm going to throw to it. Um, uh, what do we know um, about the potential long-term effects of the vaccine in the children, Sophie? And sorry, we will pick one for you next. <laughs> That's okay, Melissa. I, Are I'm you feeling a very, bit left out, Adam? <laughs> I'm very happy to say that this is absolutely Sophie's expertise, and I'm happy to defer to Sophie because she's fantastic. Um, so I think you know it's, it's a really important question to address, and um, and I'm really glad to have the opportunity to to do that. Um, so it's important to remember that um, COVID nineteen have really only been with us for. 18, 20 months may feel a lot longer than that for many of us, and that the COVID vaccine only received emergency provisional use um, in the United States in December last year. So all of these have obviously only been around for not for a long time. And so I guess in terms of addressing the potential long-term effects of vaccine, um, we need to really think about, um, you know, what, what are we concerned about? And so I think that, um, the two possible sources for long-term consequences from the COVID-19 vaccine are firstly, the components of the vaccine, and then secondly, the immunization response to the vaccine. So for young people, we're only using the mRNA vaccine. So um, my comments relates only directly to the mRNA vaccines. Um, and we know exactly what is in those vaccines. And so we can be assured of um, how they work and how they dissipate from our system. So there should be no plausible effects long-term wise from the vaccine um, ingredients itself. And then secondly, if, you know, if we remove the concerns about the, um, the, the components of the vaccine, then the only way long-term effects um, could arise due to the immunization is um, to the immunization response itself. And if we think about um, what happens when we vaccinate someone, there is a very complex process um, that occurs in our immune system, and it takes months for us to develop that immune response and build that immune memory. And so I guess by the same token, if we're going to see any significant impact or immune immunization response, um, then we would see that within the months that it takes to develop this immune response. And so, um, you know, I want to come back to that, the safety bar of vaccinating our otherwise healthy children um, should be exceedingly high. And that, um, that has been taken into consideration when we make those recommendations. Thank That's you, great. Sophie. 
Thanks, Sophie. Oh, sorry. Can I just ask you to clarify one, sorry, um, uh, right. um, a point that you mentioned, just um, uh, to prevent any confusion for people here in Australia. Um, you mentioned um, uh, in America um, the vaccine was first uh, used, I think, um, uh, emergency provisional approval, that term. Um, but could you explain how that has worked differently here and the TGA's approval processes? I know you touched on the slides. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it's really important to um, highlight the difference of our regulatory process to the United States. Um, there is no such thing as emergency, emergency authorization in, in, our, in Australia. And so TGA does a complete full assessment of the vaccine submission from the companies um, and, and go through all the available data before it can make its um, recommendation of providing provisional registration for use in Australia. So it's quite a different process to the United States. Thank you for that Thank clarification. You. Um, Adam, I might throw one to you if you wouldn't mind. I'm not a sure. Parent, a parent on here is asking, if everyone in her household is vaccinated, her child under 12 with a disability is more or less at risk of catching COVID? absolutely less at risk of catching COVID. And that's the best way to protect vulnerable uh, children or, or indeed anybody who's vulnerable in your family. We know that the majority of um, transmission occurs in the household. And so the safest way to protect uh, vulnerable children is to vaccinate the entire household. Um, that was nice and easy, thank you. Thank I you did. very much, Adam. And Fiona, I did, because you might ask me a more challenging question, I was hoping that I could jump in with, with uh, Sophie's discussion about vaccine safety, because while Please. this is absolutely uh, so Sophie's area of expertise, um, Sophie can probably confirm that we have very uh, effective surveillance systems once we have vaccines approved. And so, I mean, the, the Pfizer vaccine was first approved by the FDA based on 40,000 uh, um, participants, which is itself quite a substantial number. But in fact, we now have data on millions and millions of patients who've received uh, Pfizer, AstraZeneca and other vaccines. Um, and so, for example, it's only through studies of that size that we can start to identify those rare events, those rare side effects. And so I can see one of the questions is about the observed side effect of myocarditis in, um, in young adults. And it appears to be the case that there is a, a risk associated of myocarditis with the mRNA vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine. Um, but it can be quite difficult to compare that risk to the baseline risk or to compare that risk to the risk associated with uh, COVID, COVID infection itself. And the best study that we have to estimate that relative risk is a study of two and a, nearly two and a half million participants uh, in Israel that looked at the relative risk associated uh, with the vaccine of myocarditis, uh, estimated that there was um, approximately three per 100,000 person risk of myocarditis associated with the vaccine. But the association of the infection with myocarditis was much greater than that. Um, and, and it was estimated to be more than 11 per 100,000. Um, and, and so even for that rare, unusual association that's been observed based on data from millions of participants, we know that the benefits of the vaccine outweigh um, the risks because the risks associated with the infection remain. Thanks, Adam. Um, and Adam, could I uh, ask you to clarify um, for our audience just how transmissible Delta is, how much more transmissible it is compared to the variants um, that we saw come before? I guess just to also help explain some of the urgency um, and the concern behind community transmission now and, um, and, vaccine, and the vaccine um, uh, being understood as a solution to that, one of the solutions. I think that's a really important question because the more transmissible the virus is, the more important it is that we successfully immunize um, a, a, a greater proportion of the population if we're, if we're to prevent transmission, significant transmission. And with transmission, of course, then comes for a small number hospitalization and then um, a proportion of those, of course, who get 
seriously unwell and, and, and die. The original virus that emerged um, in early 2020 was estimated to infect around about two and a half people. For every person who was infected, they were estimated without, if, if there were no um, barriers put in place, it was estimated that they'd infect around about two and a half people. There was a new variant that emerged uh, in the UK late last year, the alpha variant, which was about 50% more transmissible. So that would, that would transmit to three and a half or four people for every person who was infected. And the Delta variant that emerged earlier this year was estimated to be another 50% more transmissible. Um, and so by now, it would appear that the Delta variant transmits from one individual on average to around about five people. So that's, you know, more than around about twice as transmissible as the original uh, variant that emerged in early 2020. And that's why it's so important to, to get appropriate uh, vaccine coverage to try to prevent uh, significant outbreaks. Thank you very much, Adam. Um, I might try and ambitiously roll a few questions into one just because we've thrown a few of these topics together and I've noticed that it's a recurring theme in the questions. Um, a few people have spoken about that increased risk of myocarditis, particularly in the uh, adolescent boys, so in that sort of 15 to 17 year old age group. And a couple of people have asked questions about the timing between the two doses. So between the first and second dose for boys in that age group, um, is it possible to lengthen the time between doses? Does that minimise the risk of those side effects? Um, would it be useful to do? And why is Australia recommending the double dose when other countries like Hong Kong and the UK are going with a single dose for young people? Is that for me or for Adam? I think it's probably for you, Sophie. Okay. Um, so first... Um, part is about the interval and um, so there's currently no evidence to suggest that um, any you know, changes in a dosing interval reduces or increases your chance of developing um, a, a myocarditis or pericarditis following um, the mRNA vaccination. And the second question was regards to why is Australia offering a two-dose schedule, whereas countries like UK um, and Hong Kong are only offering one. I guess I want to preface it by um, saying that um, the decisions may each country make are you know, taken into their own country's context and what's happening in, in their space. And also, you know, um, it, it, by, you know, we do things, it doesn't happen in vacuum. So by doing one thing, we take away other things. And so their disease epidemiology will obviously change um, what their decision making is as well. And the UK, let's just take the UK, for example, they have chosen to offer a one dose schedule. And there are a variety of factors that are considered um, for that decision. And so firstly, is um, the, the risk of myocarditis is seen more commonly after the second dose of Pfizer vaccine. But also, I think it's important to bear in mind that um, there is a significant proportion of young, chil young children and adolescents that have been infected. Um, they have been asymptomatic, so the seroprevalence rate is significantly different to our community um, rates. And, and by offering one dose of vaccine to those that are already previously had COVID, um, it gives them a boosted um, immune response to protect against future infections. Um, and for those that are not yet infected, there is still a fair amount of um, COVID circumstances circulating in the UK um, to act as potentially a boosting response to that one. So it is a very different context to what we are currently seeing in Australia. Thank you very much, Sophie. Um, can I ask a follow up question that links to this a little? Um, so a parent has asked if their son had a mild adverse reaction to the first Pfizer shot, is there an increased risk of adverse reaction on the second shot? Um, and I know as an adult getting my two jabs, I was warned after the second one that the effects might be slightly worse. Yeah, so I, th I think it depends on what the adverse reaction 
was to the first dose. Um, the systemic side effects are, you know, relatively commonly reported um, following the vaccination, and it is more so in the second dose with the mRNA vaccines. Um, but if there were allergic concerns, then they should seek, um, you know, GP opinion in terms of whether they needed a further assessment before proceeding with their second dose. In this case, I believe it was just a headache and low grade fever. So I think it was just the mild adverse reactions. Thanks, Sophie. Um, and I uh, have another question for you. Um, there's a few um, comments and concerns, questions in um, the Q&A section uh, asking about the safety of the vaccine and um, children's future fertility. Do you respond to that? Sure. Um, I think some of that comes from another myth that um, the spike protein is similar to the protein that, you know, that's been, that it gets developed as part of placenta development. Um, and that is completely not true. Um, and so by that sheer same, it is, does not affect um, fertility. And there've also been um, several studies that have looked at um, women that are undergoing um, in vitro fertilization um, treatments and having been vaccinated and it's shown that they are producing um, good quality eggs and good number of eggs as a response to their treatment. And so COVID vaccine does not affect fertility. And similarly in boys, um, there have been studies to show the volume and the quality of sperm um, following COVID-19 um, vaccination are, are, have not been affected by that. Thank you. Fiona? Sorry, I'm just flicking through the questions. There's so many good ones in here. Yeah, um, I'm trying to pick some that aren't sort of related to things we've spoken about before. <laughs> Uh, one question here, what is the likelihood that any vaccine may become less effective as the actual virus continues to evolve? And could we also throw into there, there was a question asking about boosters, maybe we could combine. And boosters probably plays into that same question indeed. I'll let you talk about boosters, Sophie. <laughs> um, well, so um, the more virus transmission there is, the more likely it is that a new variant emerges. So the reason we saw the alpha variant, the reason we've seen the delta variant is because in large parts of the world, there was a huge outbreaks and the, uh, the process by which the virus uh, evolves is a random process, a random process of genetic mutation. And eventually a particular virus will emerge, which appears fitter and survives better in the community. And that only happens if you've got millions and millions and millions of viruses circulating, billions of viruses circulating. So the best way to prevent new variants emerging is to reduce uh, infections and to reduce transmission. So that's effectively done through vaccination. And if we fail to do that, if we have significant outbreaks of infection around the world, then it's in those settings that new variants will emerge. And it is plausible, it is possible that one of those variants will, um, will have developed and will be able to um, evade uh, um, the, the vaccine response. Um, and so it's, it's not it's not highly likely, but it's, it's entirely plausible. And the solution to that is to reduce the numbers of viruses circulating. And I guess to follow up on the question about boosters. So um, current data suggests that we still have very good protective level um, six months following receiving the primary causes of our vaccines. Um, and it may be that over time we, pop, we may require booster doses. Um, but I think the question then comes to who should we be boosting? Um, and, and that question needs to be explored depending on the context um, that we are you know, facing at the time. Um, and potentially, um, you know, as, it, as it changes, that rec recommendation will also change as well. Thank you. And um, before I throw to the next question, I guess the um, uh, sensible next question is in terms of coverage for those potential new variants, Adam, um, some of which I know are potentially more infectious again, which just doesn't really bear thinking about. But um, what is the process for whether the current vaccines would cover those new variants? How would we be covered in the future by vaccines? Well, I mean, I'll give my 
understanding of the process. Sophie might may have a, a more helpful understanding. I mean, one of the things we do is, and one of we things the things we've done in an unprecedented way. There's been lots about this pandemic that's been unprecedented. Is to um, is to interrogate the virus, and we do. Um, there are there are more COVID nineteen genomes that have been sequenced than almost any other pathogen, um, and so when when these viruses emerge and when these new variants emerge, they'll be quickly detected through a very um, uh, efficient system of molecular surveillance. So, so people around the world are constantly looking at how this, this virus is evolving. Um, and, if it, and, and as a significant new variant emerges, um, if it was found to uh, initiate a different uh, immune response, then that would raise concerns that it might evade um, uh, the vaccine, because it may be that the antibodies produced by the vaccine would not be effective at neutralizing uh, this particular virus variant. So that process is, is, is one of continuous molecular surveillance of the virus. And I, I don't know for sure that it's exactly the same as what we do for influenza, but that's a process that we go through every year for influenza, because each year historically at least, each year we'd be looking to see uh, what the likely strains of influenza are in order to be able to design uh, the flu vaccine um, that's most appropriate to, to prevent disease. Um, so it, it would be a similar process to that. Ms. Sophie, anything to add? I think it's also worthwhile noting that um, the studies that have come out currently have shown that um, our vaccines are still holding up really well against the, the new Delta variant um, and that, you know, it is working, um, it's doing its job. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And I'm sorry, before I hand back to Fiona, um, uh, there has been a follow up question asked a couple of um, times now in the chat, asking about the optimal time between doses. So the studies were done um, for three weeks for Pfizer, um, but we know that some countries have rolled out um, their dosing schedule slightly differently. Um, and so the UK have gone with 12 weeks initially and have come down to um, six to eight weeks. And so um, it, in terms of, whilst we don't have an outbreak, um, it, it may be that we can say um, the optimal timing is this, but I don't think we actually know what the optimal, optimal timing is. Um, I think that the, you know, the sooner we can get the completed course in, um, the faster you are protected and that's the, the most important goal. Yeah, thank you. Fiona. Thank you. Um, Noting that you are not policymakers, I just wondered, a family has asked, do you have any view on whether the COVID-19 vaccine will become part of the QGov immunisation program? The schedule of vaccines. Oh, you mean whether we build it into the national immunisation yeah. program? Um, I actually don't, I can't comment on that. There are many considerations that um, gets you know, taken into account when we decide um, what goes on the national immunization program, both um, you know in terms of access and, and what's currently going on, um, and so that that is uh, I don't think I can comment on that at the moment. Thank you. Um, I might shall I ask another one, Melissa? So yeah, if I yes, if I go up to some of the ones that are really. Um, got some likes on them so bear in mind guys if you see a question that you really would like the answer to go ahead and hit that thumbs up button and it will pop it up to the top of the q a and we'll try to address some of the ones that are burning questions so one right at the top here if children are not getting very unwell from COVID, and this might be more for you adam um, and there are indications that vaccinating children won't change the transmission factor um, and overall outcomes for the community why are we asking children to vaccinate so can you comment on that one Thanks, Fiona. Um, I think it's a really good question, isn't it? Um, because as Sophie set out right at the outset, the primary consideration, the principal consideration um, it, when you make a decision about vaccinating children is if it's in the best interest of children. Um, I think that while we have all set out and we've all observed over these 18 months that um, children rarely get severely unwell um, with COVID-19, it's not true to say that no children get severely unwell with COVID-19. 
COVID-19. And so in the UK, for example, where they have a really excellent surveillance, national surveillance system, uh, around about 1% of children who uh, have been infected were admitted to hospital. So that's not an insignificant experience. And more than 250 children have ended up on intensive care. Um, we know that while um, uncommon, there is a very clearly associated uh, complication called um, uh, PIMS-TS, uh, Pediatric Inflammatory Multisystem uh, uh, Disorder Associated with COVID-19, uh, which is a rare but, but uh, serious complication of COVID-19. So th there are those direct effects of, of COVID-19. And then as Sophie illustrated earlier, there are the uh, problems of, of what's called long COVID, which we're still trying to understand. We're still trying to um, uh, define exactly, but anywhere between uh, four and 15% of children and young, young people are reporting some symptoms up to three months later. So, so it's, it's not true to say that COVID-19 does not affect children. And then the final thing is, of course, that where, where we've had significant outbreaks of infection, there's been a dramatic impact on children's well-being through the impact on uh, on schooling. So, so, so I think that there, there are quite clearly risks to not vaccinating children as well. Um, and then finally, the, 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 other, the other question about whether vaccinating children will impact transmission of the virus, well, that depends on your underlying um, uh, seroprevalence and underlying rates of natural immunity. And in places, as Sophie says, like the UK, where they've had an estimated seven and a half million infections, which is probably a hundred times uh, the number of infections that we've had in Australia, we've had about 90,000 infections in Australia, their rates of natural immunity are very much higher than, than ours in Australia. And so if we don't choose to immunize 12 to 18 year olds, that's still a really significant proportion of the population through which the virus can transmit. Um, so those, those, that would be my interpretation of the risks and benefits of, of vaccinating children and young people. Thank you very much, Adam. And hot on the heels of that, something else has shot right up to the top of the list. And that is what exactly is in the COVID-19 vaccine? And that might be a question for you, Sophie. Sure. Um, so I'm just going to talk about what's in um, the mRNA vaccines, not the other vaccines, um, not AstraZeneca. Um, so mRNA vaccine sounds pretty high tech, but it actually isn't. Um, so essentially what you have is um, fat particles and um, with a dash of polyethylene glycol, which is short, known as PEG. Um, and that is something that is used in lots of laxatives and other additives and lots of medications that we take. And then we have the messenger RNA, which is a protein that is produced in many of our cells. And, and that's what's been used um, to translate into making um, the spike protein, which we then produce an immune response to. So it's a pretty simple um, formulation, actually. Thank you. That's really good to clarify. When I got my vaccine, they said, are you allergic to any of the um, ingredients? And I said, I don't know, what are they? <laughs> so it's very good to hear. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> Um, so I might follow on with um, Fiona's approach. I'll keep going through the questions at the top. Um, uh, so perhaps, Sophie, this is a question for you, asking for clarification on reports that the COVID vaccine impacts upon changes in the menstrual cycle, um, bleeding or changes with regularity. So yes, um, I've heard fair people comment on this as a, as a potential concern, and I understand that um, that think studies have been looking at this in terms of the COVID menstrual cha uh, changes following vaccinations, and that it's thought to be a, a stress response following the vaccination, and largely the women that have been followed through um, have corrected in their menstrual cycle um, and had no ongoing concerns. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If I can ask uh, a somewhat related question, I've just noticed one's popped up at the bottom. Are there any contraindications for breastfeeding women? So we're a bit out of the realm of 12 to 15 year olds, but still in with children. So women who are breastfeeding, safe to have vaccine? Absolutely. Um, I, 
I think, you know, the other aspects to consider is the potential passive transfer of protection to the newborn um, through the antibodies in the breast milk as well. Thank you. Um, and um, while we're in this category of questions, um, uh, safety for um, uh, pregnant people? Okay. Me? <laughs> of the vaccine, yep. Yeah. Um, yes, there are studies that have um, demonstrated safety for its use. So mRNA vaccines, um, not um, there is less data on AstraZeneca. Um, and I think that in terms of, you know, risks of COVID infection in pregnant women, is, it's worthwhile mentioning. So if you're pregnant and you have acute COVID infection, you have a five times increased risk of being admitted to hospital and a three times increased risk of being requiring um, respiratory invasive ventilation, so supporting your breathing on a ventilator. Um, and also you have an increased risk of having your baby early and all the complications that comes with having a premature baby as well. And I know there have been some awful um, circumstances for pregnant people in New South Wales, and it has led to a couple of the colleges um, up here putting out a joint statement around the safety of the vaccine during pregnancy. So we might be able to pop that in the chat or provide it as a, um, a reference uh, after the um, session. And, um, and I'll just do one more follow up um, before I'll throw back to Fiona. Um, and I think you might have clarified it earlier, Sophie, but um, maybe if you could just do so again. Uh, um, uh, there's reference to um, someone um, uh, saying that the, the TGA um, uh, has only approved the vaccine under the state of emergency. But is this correct? You were saying before it's not? Yes. Yeah, so, um, uh, so just re-emphasizing my earlier point. Um, so we do not have the emergency authorization process in Australia. Um, so the whole um, the vaccine submission process is um, done in a complete manner with all the available data. So there is no emergency authorization use like in the United States. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, quite a few questions along uh, the myocarditis, pericarditis questions. So I imagine a few parents of adolescent boys perhaps in the higher risk group. Um, I might roll a couple in together. So one is there was some advice that came out about children not over exercising post vaccination to reduce the risk of myocarditis. Is this true? And the other one is that someone has read there's more chance of that de developing myocarditis after the second shot. And does it change based on how many shots you have? And if there's a booster, does that then give you another increased level of risk? I, th I think the easy question to answer is the question about um, the, the risk associated with the second shot that does appear to be the case um, so the estimated risk after the first dose is 10 cases of myocarditis per million first doses whereas it's significantly higher for the second dose 60 cases per million doses and again i just refer you to the the, uh, the risks associated with infection that i referred to earlier where um uh 2.4 million participants in Israel were compared between vaccine and infection and the risks associated with infection were much greater than, than that of the vaccine. So, um, so but, but it, it is acknowledged, it is recognised. In all of the cases of myocarditis that have happened in young adults in the UK, all have recovered. Um, so there have been no deaths associated with myocarditis. In, A very important point in, I was about to ask. In, Thank you, in, Adam. In young adults. Um, I have heard that same advice about um, extreme uh, exercise. I, I, I mean, I'm, as somebody who quite enjoys and, and is not very good in the gym, but works quite hard, I, I'm, I'm loath to say don't exercise. But um, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I think it's not unreasonable uh, to give some sense of common sense advice uh, in the days after the vaccine, perhaps. But um, I, I'm, I'm not aware that there's strong evidence to support it. Yeah, so this, um, I, I've also heard concerns about, you know, potentially exercise could increase your risk and there is no evidence to support that claim. And certainly um, when I spoke to our head of cardiology here at 
Queensland Children's, there has been there has been no um, recommendations in terms of limitation of activity um, following um, COVID vaccination. Um, obviously, you may not feel so well, and so you should um, you know limit your activity to see how you're going um, as you go along. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions have just popped up on the bottom that have a bit of a running theme that I think is quite important. A couple of people have asked if their child had, has, has had an allergic reaction to a vaccine in the past or to any drug in the past. One here is a chemo drug, another one is a flu vaccine. Is the COVID vaccine advisable for those children? Yes, um, as, as a simple answer, but I think there are um, specific considerations. So there are, um, you know, children who have unexplained severe allergic reactions, multiple episodes of those, then um, they should be assessed before they proceed with COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and that's just to make sure that they are vaccinated in a setting that is, um, you know, is most suitable for their, for their um, management. Um, and and otherwise, if you have um, severe allergic reactions to a food item or a, a drug like an antibiotic, then that does not increase your risk um, of having a severe allergic reaction following Pfizer or Moderna vaccination. Thank you. Um, Melissa, do you mind if I ask one more? I've just noticed a, a bit of a controversial question pop up, but I think it's worth asking. Sure. Um, someone has asked, is there any suggestion from our health system that clinicians are not allowed to say anything negative about the vaccine. The term used here is, is there any gag order that says you're not allowed to say anything negative? I think if you were to, if you were to um, engage with uh, clinicians, clinicians groups, discussions groups, you would see how robust the discussion is about mm. a subject like this. And the fact, mm. the way the pandemic has played out has reflected just how challenging it is for, um, for experts to find a way through. Um, so the notion that, um, that people are not willing to speak up about, um, uh, a, a, about a, a vaccine that they don't approve of, a vaccine that they have concerns about is, uh, is just not based on reality. Um, what many of us have seen, particularly those of us who work in infectious diseases, those of us who work in children with infectious diseases, have seen the enormous public health value of vaccination in lots of contexts and have observed just how remarkable the scientific endeavor has been to develop a new vaccine for an unheard of infection in such a short time and which has where effectively effectively rolled out saved already millions of lives um, and I have no vested interest I just I, I, my my colleagues in different parts of the world have been exhausted by the burden that COVID-19 um, imposed uh, in 2020 and early 2021 and to be able to see that uh, burden relieved in the the latest months in people who are vaccinated has been a, a remarkable thing. Um, no vested interests. I Thank also you, think it's really important um, that I think we are paediatricians um, and we care deeply about our patients, our children, um, and that we the first the principle that we work with is is in the best interest of that child um, and so um, the, our recommendations you know particularly are to, especially in your individualized recommendations required are always taken into consideration that family context and what's in the best interest for that child yeah. thank you sophie Thanks, Sophie. Thanks, Adam. Um, and what I would like to do in, in wrapping up, assure everyone um, there's been some incredible questions and so much that Children's Health Queensland can add to their uh, Q&A um, uh, fact sheets online already um, so that you can have that information. Um, and as I said before, we'll share the video of this session online and any other helpful links and fact sheets. Um, if we could get the results of the last poll up, um, that would be great. And then I'll wrap up and then we might have the poll again, if that's okay. So I wanted to show the results of um, the poll uh, about um, uh, people's uh, 
to go with just moving to it. People's level of comfort um, about getting their children um, vaccinated against COVID-19. Um, so you can see there, I'm just going to use my maths, it's a little bit different to what it was before. Um, so 61% um, uh, of you are very or quite or very comfortable or were at the start of this session with getting your child vaccinated um, and 39% um, percent were not comfortable. And I really wanted to thank all of you um, for joining us today for the time that you've taken as parents, as I said at the beginning, uh, to be seeking information to make the right decision uh, for your kids, the children in your care and your families. It's been incredible, I oh, get emotional, um, having been involved in uh, helping to amplify the voice of parents, carers and patients for the last 15 years. I've never seen anything like this last 18 months in terms of the system opening up even more to having consumers and parents like Fiona and myself at the table uh, to be supporting the pandemic response, listening when we say that people need information to make these decisions and to just see an incredible level of what we call health literacy or understanding about public health and decision making. Um, yeah, so I really wanted to thank you all for, for coming along tonight. Um, we're going to relaunch the poll if we can and we'd love to know um, your um, comfort levels now uh, to see whether they might have changed um, throughout uh, throughout this session. Um, but I also wanted to say uh, in the context of what Sophie and Adam have shared uh, in terms of us seeing now uh, that this pandemic is affecting more young people, we're wanting to prevent the spread, we're wanting to prevent the impact on, on young people um, and the impact on the health system. Um, uh, it's really, really important that you have access to sessions like these through respectful conversations with care providers who you trust uh, to give you the evidence-based information for you to make the right decision. So we hope that tonight has helped you do that. Um, I'll hand to Fiona to share the results of the final poll um, and to thank our panellists. And um, thank you so much for your time tonight. Thanks, Melissa, and thank you very much to you and to Health Consumers Queensland as well for helping to facilitate this session. And Sophie and Adam, we appreciate you taking the extra time. I know you've both had long days in clinic um, and really glad to hear from some experts, some really good, well-balanced views and clarifying some of those questions that I'm sure lots of parents have been wondering about. I'll just share the results of that last poll, which quite um, reassuringly, seems to have swung a little bit more in line with very comfortable. So I think that's a really good indication that these sessions allow parents and families to come in and ask their burning questions, the things they're really concerned about and, and getting information straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak, so that we're uh, making sure the information is correct and it seems to be working. So we've got 45% uh, of attendees have said that they now feel very comfortable, 30% quite comfortable, 25% still not quite comfortable. So hopefully once you've reviewed the video and some of the questions that we didn't get to, we'll try to answer as well. Um, I'll just share those results so you can see them. And in the meantime, we have a couple of pages that I just want to draw your attention to in terms of keeping families informed about COVID generally. So we have one, uh, which is childrens.health.qld.gov.au slash COVID-19. And that is the general COVID-19 family information site. You can get there from the Children's Health Queensland website. But the other one that's really important to know about is we have a specific um, section of the website dedicated to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families and specific information for people in that community uh, about where to access vaccines, um, the stories around um, transmission of the virus and some of that. Birdie and the Virus is there too. So I'll give a shout out to Birdie and the Virus, which is an excellent book for children that explains a little bit about what the COVID-19 virus is and why the world's gone a bit mad because it must be confusing for them. It's been a long time and they've been in and out of lockdown and in and out of school and parents in and out of work. So um, all of those things available on the Queensland, at Children's Health Queensland website. So I'd like to thank Melissa, Sophie, Adam and Damien and the team at 
CHQ comms and media engagement and Project ECHO, which is how we're bringing this webinar to you tonight. Um, and thank you very much for joining us and taking the time out of your schedule to come and ask these questions. And when we post this live, hopefully people who weren't able to get here tonight will have the benefit of those answers as well. So, so pleased to see how many people jumped in tonight. And I hope this is the first of a number of these types of events where we can ask the experts and get the right answers. So thank you very much for coming and thanks for hosting CHQ.